Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be invited to be here to talk to you um, and to keep you from your dinner. Thanks particularly to Bernard, who's invited me. Thank you to the organizers. Um, it's been a, an exceptionally slick conference. Um, that's a, a, a North American uh, slang expression. Um, if you're not quite with it, I will explain later. But also to the people of Dresden. They have uh, made us all very, very welcome. And I'd like to paraphrase John Kennedy. Ich bin ein Dresdener. <laughs> so thank you, Dresden. I also would like to thank the European Union. As Bernard knows, we've worked together on a number of European projects that the Union has funded, which enables me to be here and to have some authority to talk to you about some of these issues. Uh, going back to FP4, um, I have some grey hairs to show for these things. And also, I must make an apology to all the presenters verbal and posters, uh, for I won't acknowledge them directly by and large when I'm trying to pull out some of the key points that um, I've absorbed from being with you the last two days. I'd like to begin with this object. Uh, I think some of you know this place. Uh, some of you know it very well because you're researching it and giving us lots of good data about it. Uh, but I want to just refer to it as an image because it's the most important image to emerge from the last century, in my view. It's used extensively in advertising, and I understand it's the most viewed image on the internet, despite the pornography. And it's very important because it brought it home to all of us about the fragile nature of the ecosystem. We're there on that, floating in space. And we're messing it up. These are the stats that I noted down from the various presentations. I'm not going to go through them again. But I submit that this type of image and the simplicity of the stats presented in this way is probably more accessible to the non-technical audience than some of the complex things that we've been exploring. There's lots of other ways in which messages can be got across. But one of the key things that we've touched on several um, sessions and presentations indirectly is that we haven't really understood whose job it is to interpret all of this data and the problems that they represent and the pos possible solutions to the politicians and the people. And um, Bernard just mentioned there were some antagonists to all of this and I wasn't sure whether he was going to say well maybe we don't want to expose ourselves to them, but damn right, we've got to. We've got to get in there, and we've got to get this message over. Okay? And I just feel very inadequate, because I've been at it for 30 years, and as many people have said, there seems to be no, nothing happening. So I want to return to this point during my presentation. So um, I want to draw out three key points. Uh, one, I'm introducing myself um, as perhaps something that hasn't really been addressed uh, in the last two days, and possibly not tomorrow. And two are drawn from all the papers that we've heard. The last one has just been explored again a little bit. Uh, this politic in change management. If the world was a company, the managers would solve it quite quickly. Uh, but it isn't. And that means we have to work in very different ways.
Why do I think, from my first point, why is the Knowledge Society important? Well, here we are. More people have a cell phone than have a toilet. Okay? Quite interesting statistics here. Six billion of the world, seven billion, have access to a cell phone. Only 4.5 billion to uh, access to a toilet. And 40% of the world population on the internet. Doesn't sound so much really, does it? It's not everybody, but if you only think that in 1995 it was only 1%, what a transformation. So I think this knowledge society stuff is actually quite important to all of us. It, and I, I want to e explore a little bit more why it, it uh, affects the built environment. Ericsson, um, the um, mobile phone producers, they made a very uh, cheap uh, mobile phone station which they sold around Africa. And that's been very useful because Women in Africa do all the work, I understand. I can be corrected if, um, uh, for, by the Africans here, but uh, I understand that women do all the work. And, um, and they now can use their cell phone to find out the prices at the local market to sell their produce that they've grown when they have an excess. Um, before, they have to walk 30 kilometers to get there to find out, possibly, that the price isn't very good and it wasn't worth them going. So simple things like this mean that we get more effective food distribution and use and less food waste. Why is it important? Because I think the Knowledge Society and ICTs will be very important in very important, sorry, I pressed the animation. Um, it will be very important in um, this shared vision that uh, comes from one of the preparation papers, very good paper it is too. Because they, um, and, and I'll come back to this uh, concept uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few moments, but it's a, this is a wonderful statement, okay, really wonderful statement. I absolutely endorse it. How the hell can we do it? Okay. So difficult to achieve. It's, it's, a, it's a statement that seems to be obvious, but all the things that we've been talking about are about all the barriers in order to be able to use evidence to support our thinking. So moving over to um, thinking about the second of my uh, issues, there's no consensus about what sort of city we want. We've had very good papers on eco-cities. It wasn't clear what an eco-city should be from all of this. We've got some ideas about how we, how we may, uh, or some of its characteristics and how we might measure those. But we need to think about, rethink about what cities are for. We need to go back to Mumford. You know, cities were there, the marketplace, at the crossing of the river where the bridge was. People could go there and meet other people and, ex and do their trading. But when we're trading on the internet, I meant to have a slide which showed you the increase in the commerce over the internet, but I forgot to bring it with me. But here, here we are, I think m most people are aware now how much of this is going on on the internet. So, the view of the city as this big commercial centre is interesting, and whether it will continue to do that. But clearly, the city shown here in the um, bottom left, does anybody recognise this city? No one? It's Durban in South Africa. So, um, I have had the opportunity to go to Brazil, to the south of Brazil, and to work in a favela. I had to see the Mafia guy, I had to see the Mafia leader to get it cleared for me to go into this favela, otherwise I might not have come out again. Okay. And he introduced me to a community group there as a mad guy from England. 
my Portuguese isn't perfect, but this is my interpretation of what he said. This mad guy from England who lives in a country with all the infrastructure. He didn't use that word, but um, I think he's called them shit pipes or something like that. Um, but chooses not to be connected. And that's a thing about me. My son, when asked to draw his father at school, drew a circle with arms and legs and a little head and he coloured it all in green. And when asked by the teacher why that was his father, he said, he's round and he's green. My house was super insulated 35 years ago. I, I grow my own biomass. Uh, I, 25 years ago, I put in a dual water system. Okay, so the drinking water and the grey water are kept separate, and I use the untreated water to flush the toilet. So we all have to live, or walk the talk, as I think the North Americans call it. Of course, the other vision we kid ourselves with is visions like this. Does anybody recognize this place? Seems to be a fair amount of recognition of this place. Um, one of my good wheezes in the past was to get a joint master's program going on with Venice, which meant I had to go there twice or three times a year. And sorry, Florence. <laughs> Terrible slip of the tongue. Um, it's a good job my, my friend isn't here, otherwise he'd kick me, but never mind. Um, okay. The European Heritage City. Uh, some years ago, I um, ran a debate in Leeds, a northern uh, 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 town in, in England, about what the city of the future should be like. Of course, I, I did the Bill Rees. I gave her all the problems and all the really bad stuff and how it was really difficult to think about what we need to do with cities. My uh, opponent in the debate came and showed pictures of northern Italian hill towns. And so I lost the debate. This house, that house did believe in cities because I am not necessarily an advocate of very big cities. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the mid mid medium-sized city here today. But the other thing that this slide shows us is the issue, starts the issue of locking, which has been discussed in various papers. These are sort of barriers that exist because something else is already there. And this is heritage locking. And lots of problems in this city in trying to get change of the type that we've been discussing because of all this heritage, okay? And increasingly in, in uh, uh, European cities, it, there, it's all also environmental heritage, actually parks, national parks, and other sorts of landscape which is valued for different reasons and it's not available for development. Anybody recognize this city? Well, let's start with what continent is it on? No one gonna risk? No? North America, would it be? So is this a good model for a city? If not, why not? If you, um, would you like to live in this low rise, very distributed? And here the lock in is the transportation system, which makes it quite difficult to think about the sort of changes that have been discussed today. So, trans transportation. Um, but it, uh, um, other lock-ins that we've discussed are uh, sewage distribution or collection systems, um, water supply distribution systems, the existing infrastructure uh, which locks us into quite a, a number in, or locks us in in quite a number of ways. The other issue about the urban environment is its resource intensity. 
And um, here we've got the statistics for construction in the UK. Uh, seven tons per person per annum. Uh, in the US, it's 11 tons, a bit beyond 11 tons. When I taught architecture students about sustainable building, I used to say, think of these figures when you pick the pen up, because as you draw those lines, in, in um, figurative terms, you're spending those resources. And so you should think about that very heavy pen that you're moving around on the drawing board. And this was the one way I tried to get them to understand about the quantity of resources. But the other lock-in that's in here is about half of this is on retrofit and maintenance. So the problem we have in the built environment is this very slow rate of change. And so I'm sorry, William or Bill, it's going to be really difficult to change the built environment in the timescales that, that we need to think about. And so we do need to look at other means, not just, we can't build our way out of this problem by making lots of very super efficient eco-cities. We've got to work with what's there. Of course, the other aspect of uh, this dematerialization has been a major policy push in the affluent countries towards the information society and the sort of idea of the information city. It's 15 years old. Um, some of the people in the room here participated in workshops that we ran um, about that some years ago. And you can see here one of the key things is to know how and to know why. And this was meant to help with changing behavior. The type of information that you guys have been putting in front of us was if people understood that, then at least the professionals and the politicians would start to change their behavior. And of course, the ultimate vision was the utopian vision, which comes from another Bill, Bill Mitchell. And um, he talked about ICTs with the intimacy of underwear. And I think we're getting towards that. Okay, um, But inside that was a sort of soft transformation which was envisaged. And um, the utopia was seen as being essential to an eagora where consensus about the types of problems we're talking about might emerge. But my point at the bottom here is, is it delivering? And I think the jury's out. But it's still strong policy driver in uh, European countries. The other aspect of this is the existing city morphology. And uh, this one's from the UK Urban Task Force. And uh, it's really about how to think about um, ideal mobility structures for cities, where you have local hubs connecting to regional, uh, um, um, sorry, district hubs, which um, then connect to the town centre. And the figures are about, uh, you know, what type of facilities major opera center, for example, or a, a classical orchestra, and, and the type of amount of population that are needed to, to support such facilities. And I think some of the discussion about mobility, both between cities and within cities, has been one of the things that you, we do need to add to a discussion about um, eco-city development. But the other thing that, that this uh, group, the Urban Task Force under Richard Rogers, um, identified or seemed to imply is a fairly clear urban boundary. My experience is that's quite difficult to spot. And um, we've been having lots of, or we've had lots of presentations about this peri-urban boundary. And this is where I think a lot of the ecosystem services are going to be placed and in, in, in the peri-urban area. And it potentially, as, as I think was touched on in, in the last discussion, 
potentially it's a battleground because you all want a bit of it. Some of the water engineers want to put stuff there. Uh, some people want to put recreation there. Um, other people want to have um, uh, urban farming. And if we all try and put that in this space, I can see a different type of expansion of cities and the relationship they have with their hinterland. It's easy to make new buildings very green and efficient. The main problem is retrofitting, as I've already mentioned. And we have to retrofit the city. And the issue is whether we want to make the whole city autonomous or whether it's just a district or the individual districts of the city or whether it's individual buildings that need to be autonomous. Uh, because that has there are major implications there for the type of infrastructure, water, soils, all the other things that we've been discussing. And uh, we've sort of, in many of the uh, presentations, again implicitly being addressing the um, characteristics of a sustainable community. And the UN's, and you'll see I put a U in here, they call it a sustainable development goal, but if we're talking about most people being in cities, we ought to talk about it being a sustainable urban development goal. Number 11. And um, again, these things are well recognized. I think the only one that might be contestable is the compact one. I'm not so sure going very compact would be the ideal uh, because we, if we want to have a lot of urban agriculture um, and food production, uh, the pig in the parlor, as it used to be called in Ireland, um, then um, we need space to do that inside the city. Although, as we have heard from a number of speakers, uh, we can cover the buildings with green, green space. I'm getting the signal already. Ooh, time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Okay. Um, so I think the um, main issue here then is how do we measure progress? I think the key point here is the th three column model for sustainable development or the eco city isn't adequate and UNEP have always had this institutional column and we do need indicators for how we make institutional progress. And um, the, so one of the questions from one of the ladies from the audience earlier was about this relative um, measures and I think that's actually quite important. There's also the professional nexus. Um, a lot of professionals um, are still misinformed, uninformed, don't know they don't know about a lot of the issues that we've been discussing. And um, you can see I was not sufficiently informed because I didn't put, uh, n neither was um, Egan with his skills review. We didn't put in water engineers and urban agronomists in the list when we made this slide. So as we heard from Bill, we're all in denial. But part of that is created by this confusion. And this is exacerbated um, by the lack of consensus over aims and the vision for eco-cities, measures of assessment and some of the assumptions that we have, because if we don't have to address everything all the time, then we have to make some assumptions, and those are the problems we get. The means by which we deal with those that lose out, any development means someone has to lose. They lose some space, they lose a service. Um, the other confusion is we assume that humans will behave rationally, and that the other aspect that causes confusion was the rebound effect which we heard about. And so as we've heard, pilot studies are needed. And there are lots of good examples of pilot studies. But as I, I showed in the professional slide, the professionals don't learn. Right? If it wasn't invented here, they do not learn from 
previous pilot studies. And so there's the barrier there. I'm nearly there. So as this shows, uh, slide shows, the information does not necessarily lead to increase awareness, and increased awareness does not necessarily lead to action. And we need a lot of other approaches. And that's why it was so difficult for me to see uh, how we could get Konstanzas and Kubizansky's um, vision of the Nexus important, uh, important vision. And the key to this, in my view, is trust. And so just to come to a, uh, a conclusion, what we have to do to address William or Bill Reese's concerns is we have to try and plan for the upside of down. I didn't coin this expression, but I think it's a very useful way of thinking about what we've got to do. We're going to have a reduction in resources, perhaps um, some reduction in quality of life, and how we make the best of that. And these are some of the features that we have from, or, or ought to consider in these things, some of which I had before, some of which I've added to as a consequence of today. But Bill also had hope. He, he, he did hope quite, despite the really glum pitch he gave us, he did use the word hope quite a lot. And um, there is hope. This is the uh, Irwell in Manchester in the 1870s. Now you can catch fish in the Irwell trout and you can eat them. Okay? If I'd said that to my father or my father said that to me 30 years ago, we'd never believed it. But the key thing about that is it required a whole watershed approach. So the, one of the other political barriers that's there, which we've heard about, is the fact that political boundaries don't correspond with those uh, units of analysis that we need to be making. And so this requires some intelligence. So I'll leave you with a new nexus. I'm sorry to offer you even another one. But um, this is the fact that we have the urban environment and the natural environment, and we've, you've been mainly talking today about the nexus between those two. But I think we have to plan the virtual environment as well because it is going to influence how people use cities and what they expect from them. So uh, that's all I have to say, apart from a final apology, which I'd like to make on behalf of all the citizens over 55 to 60, because I include, I'm, I'm just short of 65. Uh, because I came into this business the research business and the built environment business. I trained as an architect originally um, because I thought I could make a difference. And uh, soon I'll leave the stage, as they say, actually. And, um, and as I leave the scene, I'm a bit anxious that, um, that collectively people in my age group are leaving the world in a worse shape than when we came into it. And that's a bit of a sad point to end on. But I wish you well in all your future endeavours. Thank you.